Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Announcing the arrival of Yang Berhormat Senator Datuk Sri Diraja Dr. Zamri bin Abdul Qadir, Minister of Foreign Affairs and fellow VIPs. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Yang berhormat Senator Datuk Sri Diraja Dr. Zamri bin Abdul Qadir, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Yang berusaha Puan Wan Azilawati binti Wan Mahmud, Chief Executive, Performance Acceleration Coordination Unit. Chief Secretary to the Government of Malaysia, Director of the International Institute of Islamic Thought, Secretaries General, Directors General, Foreign Heads of Mission and Representatives of International Organizations, Senior Government Officers, Forum Panelists and Participants, Media Partners, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. A very good morning and welcome to the International Forum on Islamophobia, Meaningful Engagement Through Madani Discourse. I am Daniel Bahardin and I will be your Master of Ceremony for today's event. Members of the floor, Malaysia is in a unique position to take the lead in championing efforts towards interfaith dialogue and other relevant forms of engagements aim at reducing Islamophobia and interreligious misunderstandings both in its immediate Asian region as well as internationally. As part of this endeavor, the Prime Minister's Office, in collaboration with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, KLN, and International Institute of Islamic Thought, IT, is organizing an important one-day conference on Islamophobia today. For the first part of the conference today, they, there will be a forum discussing the issues and challenges of Islamophobia that will be discussed by our panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start our event today, let me invite Al-Fadil Al-Ustaz Izzat Azizi bin Haji Zainal, Johan Tilawa Al-Quran, to recite Surah Al-Hujurat verse 10 to 14.
members of the floor. To begin our event today, let me invite Yang Berhormat Senator Dato Sri Diraja, Dr. Zamri bin Abdul Qadir, Minister of Foreign Affairs, for his welcoming remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> you have to go to the to the right rostrum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera dan uh, selamat pagi. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, being uh, prime ministers, uh, you are bound to uh, to read your prepared text. Uh, um, well, as much as I want to, uh, to, to also share some of my thoughts, yeah. but, uh, you know, you're guided with certain, uh, certain, certain uh, principles. However, I'll try also to, uh, to share some of my thoughts as well along the, my, along the speech. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I wish to... Uh, to, co to congratulate and express my utmost uh, appreciation to the Prime Minister's Office for organizing this international conference on Islam and Islamophobia uh, towards a meaningful engagement through the Madani approach, <clears throat> which could not have come at a more at a more appropriate time. Given the current world volatile condition today. It is of utmost importance to address challenges confronting the Muslim Ummah today collectively and urgently. And I believe this conference is a crucial platform to cultivate dialogues and stimulate intellectual discussion among uh, policymakers, experts, scholars, and advocates from all around the world. This meeting of minds would then be able to primarily examine the root causes and processes, as well as identify the adequate responses needed to address the most pressing issues of the Muslim Ummah, Islamophobia, religious intolerance, and discrimination. As the world gears towards a new modern era, shaped by the advancement of technology, it is unfortunate that the world today is still held hostage by misperception and negative stereotypes. This negativity has a sole purpose. Quite interesting to see we are living today in the, as uh, Professor Ziauddin Sardar uh, says, we are living in a post-normal period or post-normal time. It is a time and period that is characterized by complexities, chaos, and contradiction. Quote him. Complexities is due to everything is connected to everything else. And it's very difficult for us to see any event 
unfolding before us to a single cause. As uh, we see also in the Islamophobia today, it is already a well-established global trend. As uh, Professor Ziauddin Sardar and uh, his friends, Jordi Serra and Scott Jordan uh, wrote in their Muslim societies in post-normal time. It becomes a well-established global trend, as I mentioned just now. It is not only happening in America in, or in EU. It's widespread everywhere. In Myanmar, Australia, India, and the rest of the world. Of late, we are bombarded with various news of Islamophobic acts across the other parts of the world. It is also probably due to the historical and colonial construction to some. As we all know, for example, as early as the 20th century, the words Islamophobia already coined by what, uh, French scholars. And also, it's being debated in different form. But generally, it connotes in different form of negativities. It's difficult to find any objectivity in their analysis. I'm not trying to accuse anyone in here, but that's from the French scholarship, for example. That also applies to, to other parts of the world, including in the British colonial discourse. Well, we have people like Renan in France, who's been talking about the complexities of Islam and the backwardness of Islam. We also have in our context, in Malaysia, for example, in British Malaya, people like Sweetenham. In his uh, Malay sketches, describing the life of the uh, Malay society, Malay Muslim society, in the very backwards descriptions. So despite having this uh, colonial constructions, but since uh, the dreadful September 11 incidents, which took place two decades ago, the rise of Islamophobia, which is primarily centered on ignorance and bigotry, is alarming. What is more concerning in our time? There are worrying developments and trends, and trends that are pushing towards normalizing Islamophobia. There is the rise of the majority in the populist and extreme right spectrum, which often includes a strong anti-Islam component in their discourse. This culminated in hostility and Islamophobic acts towards Muslims. Malaysia is not spared in the wake of Islamophobia as a predominantly Muslim country. One may hold an assumption that Islamophobia does not exist here. However, its domestic manifestation has emerged. This is evidenced by the arrest and series of charges against several individuals who ridicule the religion of Islam, Muslims, and Islamic figures, especially on social media. Islamophobia has become globalized by a number of factors, including the spread of radical extremist ideologies, the rise of far-right political movement, or now they call alt-right, 
it's not far right. ALT, outright. And a growing prevalence of negative media portrayals of Muslims. These global forces have had a major impact on the way Muslims are seen and treated, even marginalized in many countries throughout the world. In certain countries, these factors have enabled violence against our brothers and sisters. Disturbing occurrences such as the desecration of the Holy Quran in Sweden, the murders of Muslims during the prayers in New Zealand, the anti-Muslims riots in, in, in India are nothing but highlight, uh, highlighting the detrimental impacts of Islamophobia worldwide. The systemic operations of Muslims also continues unabated. The decade-long ban on minerals in Switzerland, the refusal of certain European governments to accept Muslim refugees, and the continuous harassment faced by Muslim women, women in the West who choose to wear the hijab highlights the different forms of Islamophobia that exists today. Therefore, these examples must be treated as a clear call to action to combat Islamophobia and promote harmonious relations and peaceful coexistence in an otherwise diverse global community. It's now the Qari written. Very, very important verse. Ya ayuhan nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa unsa wa ja'annakum shu'uban wa qaba'ilan lita'arafu inna akramakum inna Allahi atfaqum. How God creates humankind. Yeah? Based on the different religion, different group, different tribes. For them to know each other. That's the basis of the Quranic injunction for us all to practice together. Islamophobia not only affects the life of millions of people, but also erodes the very fabric of society and threatens the values we hold dear as Muslims and also as human beings. It is my, my profound belief that sophisticated mechanisms are needed to address the challenges posed by this phenomenon. We cannot merely rely on conventional approaches to combat discrimination and prejudice. Instead, we must be proactive in developing effective strategies for today's landscape. Ladies and gentlemen, We must recognize that Islamophobic acts is not simply a matter of hate or prejudice towards Muslims. It is a flagrant violation of fundamental human rights. When Muslims are discriminated against by the public en masse, it undermines the very principles of pluralism and equality that democratic societies pride themselves upon. It is within this cardinal belief that freedom of expression cannot be equated with freedoms of insult, or freedom to insult, which goes against the universal principle of respect for religious. Furthermore, the right to believe and practice one's religion is also enshrined in international law as a fundamental human right. Muslims should have the right to profess their faith without fearing discrimination, persecutions, and intimidations. If we allow Islamophobia continues unabated, we are complicit in violating this fundamental human rights. We deny our Muslim brothers and sisters 
the right to express themselves freely and practice their, their faith without fear of retributions. I strongly believe that Islamophobia leads to tangible economics and social ex exclusion, limiting the opportunities av available to the Muslims Ummah and restricting them from reaching and unleashing their full potential. It is important to note that Islamophobia root causes lies in misinformation. Therefore, it is often linked to broader social and political issues such as xenophobia, racism, and anti-immigrant sentiments that are also fueled by a lack of unbiased information. Addressing these underlying issues is critical in rebuilding tolerance and respect for all walks of life. By doing so, we are fulfilling our duty to uphold the fundamental human rights of all individuals while building a more inclusive and equitable society. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm strongly worried that there is an absence of a strong, united response from the Muslim world to combat Islamophobia. Indeed, the silence that permeates through us is a worrying trend. Together, the Muslim world has a considerable amount of resources at its disposal. However, there is a lack of a holistic strategies to mobilize these resources to create actionable change. Many pins the blame solely on the West for allowing Islamophobia to grow. While it is easy to do so, the current poor state of affairs also reflects the current hesitancies of the Muslims on one. It is crucial to recognize that there is much work to be done by Muslim countries. It is the collective responsibility of the Ummah not only stand for Islam's defense, but to also present Islam in a positive light that highlights its true beauty and values. To this end, Malaysia stands ready to further solidify bilateral and regional cooperations with Indonesia and Brunei, as well as in multi multilateral fora in matters of great interest for the Muslim Soma. We must not be deterred by powerlessness in the face of systematic discrimination of Islam. There must be a collective global efforts to unite Muslim countries, international organizations, NGOs, Islamic scholars, and individuals. Among the concrete steps taken by some countries to combat Islamophobia is passing legislation that penalizes hate speech and discrimination against Islam. However, our efforts must not be limited to only this scope. Knowing that Islamophobia is rooted in misinformation, we must continue to promote understanding and celebration of diversity, challenge hate crimes, and take steps to ensure that the right and dignity of all people are respected. We must also start educating people about the true nature of Islam to ensure that it is not confused with other issues such as terrorism or religious extremism that we are staunchly against. Standing as a successful modern-day models of a harmonious multi-religious, multicultural, multiracial Muslim majority countries, Malaysia is uniquely positioned
to spearhead efforts towards interfaith dialogues and engage with its Muslim brotherly nations to develop strategies on a global scale. I suggest this undertaking to be done under the patronage of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, o OIC, to reaffirm its commitment to counter this phenomenon. Towards this end, young Ahmad Bahormat, Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim also put forth a forward-looking vision for Malaysia. Malaysia Madani. I have to pronounce it correctly, Madani. Don't put double D there. That would carry different meaning. Yeah. Malaysia Madani, as ambitions, lays out our aspiration of a civilized, skilled, and inclusive society based on six core values, namely sustainability, prosperity, innovation, respect, trust, and compassion, or ihsan. This vision is well received by our Muslim brothers and sisters across the globe. Such a society would never result to means other than tolerance and harmony. It is a society that, that is rooted in respect, trust, and compassion that is instilled in all citizens regardless of their creeds and belief. This is the secret ingredients of Malaysia's peace and harmony in a diverse community. Undoubtedly, it is an uphill challenge given the rise of Islamophobia across the world. But there is an urgent need to engage with the global Muslim community to come on board and address the pressing issues faced by the Muslims Ummah. I sincerely believe that today's conference will initiate the move to develop the framework, strategies, and action plans to combat Islamophobia. Precisely for this very reason, your presence here is no coincidence. With my putras unwavering commitment to combat Islamophobia on, on the global levels with other leading actors such as the OIC will remain strong. Based on this mechanism, Malaysia will continue to play a leading role in spearheading Malaysia's Madani agenda in promoting the tenets of Islam and combat Islamophobia at the international fora. Through the values and principles which Malaysia Madani holds, this will restore the trust that Malaysia had among the Muslim Ummah. Islamophobia can only be adequately addressed if all parties work together to fight it. We must speak out against prejudice, injustice, support our fellow Muslims, and stand with them in solidarity. With this, I wish the International Conference on Islam and Islamophobia towards a meaningful engagement through the Madani approach a success. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Senator Dr. Sri Raja Dr. Zamri for the welcoming remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, we will continue our event today with a forum entitled Islamophobia, Issues and Challenges to Muslim World, which will be led by our moderator, Mr. Ahmad Fami bin Muhammad Samsudin, Chief Executive Officer of the Global Peace Mission, GPM. Mr. Ahmad Fami, the floor is all yours.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator, Rami. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And a very good morning. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, I would like to uh, congratulate the Prime Minister's Office, the Ministry of Home, uh, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, and also the International Institute of Islamic Thought, the IIIT, uh, for organizing or for taking the initiative to organize and host uh, this event this morning. Um, <clears throat> the event, which is known as the uh, International Forum for the Islamophobia Meaningful Engagement uh, through Madani Discourse, and I believe that the, this initiative reflects our collective concern and also our active role that we need to play in malicious context regarding the issues that touches the heart of billion people around the world, that is Islamophobia. And uh, I'm very grateful and honored to be here this morning with the presence of the distinguished audience and the participant uh, this morning, including the uh, three, Dr. Abdul Qadir, and also uh, other guests uh, from the embassies. So distinguished participant, His Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to speak to you today uh, on one specific topic that is the managing challenges of Islamophobia in the postmodern era, uh, globalizing malicious Madani discourse. So if we look at in history, the Islamophobia is not a new thing. It has a long history that is the fear or hatred or prejudice against religion of Islam and Muslim. It is not a mere recent phenomenon. It has been there for many years. In fact, it has been in existence since the beginning of the arrival of Islam. The effort to undermine Islam and the, the wrong portrayal of the image of Muslim and Islam in the world has started since the beginning of the Prophet's time. And it has continued to evolve uh, passing through centuries and generations up until today. So, when it's happened in this century, it is not something that it is surprising, but it is something that we have to uh, manage uh, and deal with. And uh, today we are living basically in the 21st century in which the world has become more globalized. And I would say that in today's world become more connected than ever before. Technologically, we are connected, and the distance also become closer to each other. But it is very unfortunate. We are emotionally distant. We are detached. So the, techno the te technology that we have today is not sufficient to bring us closer. The purpose of technology, that is to bring us closer, supposedly to bring us closer, to build more understanding, to build more ability to learn from each other, but unfortunately it works against us. And it is not only happened to Muslims. We are talking here this morning about the problem of Islamophobia, which is taking place among the Muslim community. But we also need to remember, the problem of Islamophobia is not the only problem that we have today. If you speak to other nations, you speak to Chinese, for example, he's going to say that Islamophobia is not the only problem that we have. We also have a similar problem, that is xenophobia. The fear against Chinese. During COVID-19 pandemic, for example, the anti-Asian uh, uh, crimes or the anti-Asian uh, discrimination and also xenophobic narrative in the West is on the rise and has been rising since then. And if you speak to African people, the black people in the United States, in other parts of the world, they're going to talk about negrophobia. And if you speak to Russian today, the Russian is going to say that in today's world, seeing the Ukrainian issue, they also suffered the Russophobia, the fear against Russian, everything related to Russia. So this makes me wonder, or this makes us wonder, what is wrong with the world because we become globalized. I mean, the whole world turned into a global village and we become 
as the word or the phrase say, globalization of the local and localization of the global. To show how connected we are technologically. But emotionally, we are distant. We fail to build connection with others. And because of that, there is a wall of perception built up times and again. And of course, it is also because of other factors as well, which I'm going to mention later. So now, uh, if we look at this, uh, the reality of the world today, we can see that the world become more digital place. This is according to Adam Newman, uh, an Israeli-American billionaire who observed this phenomenon. But we cannot forget about human connection, he said. The world become a more digital place which is technologically connected, but it is not in terms of human connection. So now, as the Dr. Zambri mentioned just now, the globalization is not only something brings something benefit to us, but also something which is, can be turned against us. So there is what we call as globalization of Islamophobia these days. When I, as I said earlier, it is not only the globalization of Islamophobia, but globalization of xenophobia in the world today. So in one hand, we have the globalization which brings us closer and nearer and connected in terms of technology but in not in terms of human connection. However, in order to proceed further, I think it is important for us to have a right perspective of looking at this issue. Right perspective means that we need to look at Islamophobia holistically. Because when we read the discourse of Islamophobia, we all come across with certain narrative. So, in this discussion, I would like to offer four perspective or angle that we can understand or explore the problem of Islamophobia. The first one is, is the most popular one. The, most, uh, the, the, the first perspective is Islamophobia is the Western problem. Islamophobia is a Western problem because it is manufactured by the Western media against Muslim and Islam. I would say to some extent it's true. There are efforts, there are things which is done in the media, and there are also things which is done uh, by the states, what we call as institutionalized Islamophobia, which appear in the form of policy, mass surveillance, for example, or discrimination against certain group, resulting from the immigration uh, of Muslim, of people from the Middle East into Europe, for example. And there is a raising concern in Europe, for example, about the invasion of Muslim in Europe. And you can see this thing happen, for example, uh, in the discourse of people such as um, the, the attacks in the Christchurch, New Zealand, by the Branton Terran. If you read the, uh, the, the, the books or the, the, the manifesto published by the Branton Terran, that is a great replacement, you can see the similar narrative. And also in, in Norway, someone like Breivik, which actually killed a lot of people, believing that the Europeans is under siege by foreigners. And of course, the role of the media as well is also important in, in doing this kind of uh, manufacturing certain news, which is anti-Muslim messaging. Therefore, Islamophobia become an industry a very big industry supported by the think tank, by the so-called aspect on Islam, advising government and think tanks about what to do with Islam and Muslim in their countries. Training were made or training were given to certain law enforcement agencies to detect what we call as the indicators of radicalization, targeting mosque and Muslim and therefore, this again create the sense of Islamophobic experience among Muslims in those places. So I think this is the first perspective that we can uh, uh, see. 
The second perspective is Islamophobia is a Muslim problem. This is another thing that we have to acknowledge. The problem of ISIS, for example, the violence and the atrocities committed by ISIS, whether it is in the Middle East and in, in Europe and across the world. I mean, when we talk about ISIS, of course, Middle East and Europe is not the only victim. We also have some Malaysian traveling to that place of the world, joining ISIS and bring back their ideology and posing threat to national security, of course. ISIS has actually become a big problem. It's not only to the, uh, to the West, but also to the Muslim. Brothers. And if you look back in history, there are three key events that have shaped the discourse of the Western media. And actually, it's a problem that we are facing in the Muslim community. Number one is the Iranian Revolution, which is taking place in 1978. The Iranian Revolution had to shock the West basically. It shows the rising, uh, the emergence of an Islamic state, so to speak. And that actually, that experience shaped the narrative in the media and also uh, the policy makers of that. A lot of research and books has been written about the impact of Iranian revolution. The second one is 9-11. Of course, 9-11 is a key event that has shaped the world and how they see Islam and how they see Muslims. And the last one is ISIS. So these three key events show up the problem of Islamophobia in the world. And we acknowledge, of course, that in one hand we have the role of media that is externally generated Islamophobia experience. We also have to acknowledge that there is internally generated Islamophobic problem that we have in the Muslim world. And not to mention about the authoritarianism of the certain governments that actually portray the wrong image of Islam to the world. And of course, when we talk about immigration in certain countries in Europe, for example, the attitude of Muslims who are living in the West also can cause certain anxiety among the society in those countries. So I think this is the second perspective that we can see Islamophobia. The third one is Islamophobia, also an epistemological problem. Dr. Zamri mentioned just now about how the Orientalists portray the image of the foreigners, of the others. In the form, and it is written in the books, actually. It is written in the book. If we read Karl Marx, for example, or Frederick Engels, description of Muslim, this is epistemological problem. The, how they portray the image of others in their texts, in their books, in their discourse. And if we go back again in history, we can see even Winston Churchill, I think he used to, he used to write something uh, in his work, portraying certain image of Muslim as well. Let me read to you one of the, uh, the uh, things that he, he wrote in the, the history, the, the story of Malikan Field Force. He said that Mohammedan religion increases instead of listening the fury of intolerance. That was the description that he gave. I repeat, the Mohammedan religion increases instead of listening the fury of intolerance. This is written by Winston Churchill. So, when we talk about Islamophobia, therefore, it is also an epistemological problem that we have to deal with. It's not only about media, it is not only about the external, uh, the domestic problem that we face. So this is another challenge. The last point, the last challenge that we have is Islamophobia as individual problem. I think finally, it goes back to human attitude. Human attitude in terms of the uh, mindset, Ignorance, egocentrism, the sense of superiority toward an inferiority of others, <laughs> believing that others as inferior comparatively, and exclusivism. And if I quote the 
one of the German leaders, Angela Merkel, he said that they carry hatred in their hearts. You understand it, right? I think this point explains accurately that Islamophobia as an individual problem. Beside institutionalized, state-supported and sponsored policy of Islamophobia. So, they, these are the four things, the four perspectives that we need to address when we speak about Islamophobia. Now, what is the way forward? I would say there are two things that we can think about. Number one is a very simple idea of returning to the idea of karamat al-insan, meaning that see human as human, humanizing human. I think the biggest problem that we are facing when it comes to Islamophobia is seeing others as enemies or subhuman. This perception is going to shape the way we write, the way we speak, and the way policy is crafted. When we start seeing others as enemy, rather than as something that we can learn from, then that we can benefit from, then the problems, the thing is going to go wrong way. The Al-Qari earlier mentioned about in uh, uh, God created people of different races, different gender, meaning that to learn and to benefit from each other. I think that is the best solution that we can have at the individual, societal and the state level, including at the international level. I think the, the idea of European Union, for example, is built upon this idea of learning and benefiting from each other. It was successful before. Similar kind of things can be done in dealing with Islamophobia when we leverage more on the ability to learn and benefit from each other, not to look at others as the enemies. I think when religious political element seep into the discourse and thinking, and that is going to colors a little bit that influence the way we behave with others. So I think this is two things that is seeing others as human. The other one is the ability and to leverage on learning and benefiting from each other. I think that is going to stop. And I think this is the essence of the Madani discourse that we are uh, promoting uh, these days. I think I stop there and I give opportunity to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Islam and phobia, the fear of Islam. Who fears Islam and why? May I just use gives me a bit of freedom as well. I can shake, shake my hands, but it looks like I can only shake my hands and can't communicate anymore. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Islam or phobia? The O connects Islam and phobia. The fear of Islam. So we have to ask who, who fears Islam and why? Right from the inception of Islam, there have been people who have feared is Islam. The, the first challenge that Islam presented to the world was a theological challenge. The theological challenge was very Put. That's right. 
the theological challenge was very succinctly put by Christians. Basically, what need was there for an Arabian prophet when the Son of God had already died for the salvation of humanity? A very fundamental question from Christian perspective that to this day presents a theological challenge to the, the, the Christian world. Some, of course, have accepted, uh, uh, have embraced the challenge and have been involved in debate and dialogue and acceptance, while others haven't accepted, the, uh, for, for, while for others the challenge really is very problematic. There was intellectual challenge right from the beginning of Islam as well. Within 50, 60 years after the death of the Prophet, the Muslim culture and civilization expanded. There was intellectual, you know, boom, uh, scholarship, learning, science were being promoted. So there was this intellectual challenge. And that was an intellectual challenge that Islam presented to Europe as a whole. And then, of course, there was also, a, if you like, a military challenge because the Muslim world was expanding, empires were, empires were, were coming and going. So these three challenges then coalesced to produce certain discourses about Islam and Muslims. So the first theological discourse begins with very early on with John of, John of Damascus, who knew a great deal about Islam because he was an Arab and lived in a Muslim society, but deliberately went out to construct, a the, present a theological construction of Islam which was distorted, which was basically almost paranoid. In his, in, his, in, his, in, his, in, his, in his representation. That kind of Christian kind of polemics has continued. But then there was the intellectual challenge. How do we, how do we, how does Europe, how does the West meet the intellectual challenge of Islam? And there a special discourse was, was constructed, a discourse of knowledge to represent Islam in a specific way. Um, we know that that discourse is nowadays known as Orientalism, and this is normally associated with scholarship and, and high literature of, of the West, beginning with, with 17th, 18th, maybe even uh, 19th century. But in fact, it has a long history. Islam Orientalism doesn't begin in 18th century. It is a much longer history going, going back to 16th, 16th, 15th century. But Islam uh, Orientalism is, was developed essentially as a, as, a, as a knowledge discourse to represent Islam and Muslims as darker sides of Europe. Now it is important for us to appreciate that not all Orientalists were engaged in this exercise. Many of the Orientalists genuinely loved Islam, some even converted. Uh, Many made profound contribution to our thought and learning about Islam, but the discourse as a whole went out to represent Islam and Muslims as the darker side of Europe. The intellectual challenge proceeds with the emergence of colonization, where now you have to present a justification not just of colonization, but also a, a, a representation of the people you're colonizing. And there you have a whole new representation of Muslims as, as not worthy of governing themselves, lazy. The classic example is the myth of lazy native, a profound book by Sayyid Hussain al that I recommend everybody, that I expect everybody here to have read, but if you have not read, you should have read it by now go out and buy it, uh, which actually shows, I mean, it's of, of course, it's about Mal Malays in Malaysia, but in fact, the thesis is general, that almost all non-Western cultures, whether it was Indians, 
or Africans or Arabs who were colonized were actually represented within the colo colonial literature as inferior people who needed to be civilized and so on and so forth. Now, up to now, we can regard all this, if you like, as a, essentially as a segment of xenophobia or, and racism, right? Uh, which was limited to certain segments of European society. For example, in the 18th and 19th century, uh, the masses knew very little about Islam and cared even less, right? There was no real, um, if you like, Islamophobia amongst the masses. Now, this is true even up to the 50s and the 60s. So when I was growing up in, in, in England as a young boy, there was a lot of racism, but there was no such thing as Islamophobia. Basically, during my youth and university days, the Muslims in the United Kingdom were regarded as very law-abiding and moderate citizens. And this is true till 1989 with the publication of the Satanic Verses. When the Satanic Verses was published, for the first time, the Muslims came out on the street and said, okay, we are very law-abiding and very wonderful folks, but there are certain things, certain things we do not like and we are going to object to them. And that's where, in fact, the whole dynamic shifts and while kind of, if you like, the representation of Islam is, was limited to certain segments of society, now it becomes a popular culture, a question of popular culture. Because what the Rushdie affair did was to, to some extent legitimize the kind of representation of Islam as against freedom of expression, as oppressive people, Muslims as oppressive people, uh, Muslims who cannot, cannot tolerate, toler uh, Muslims uh, as people who cannot show tolerance of any kind, etc., etc. It actually seeped, all that seeped in popular consciousness. And that's where the big, big change takes place. And we see the first seeds of Islamophobia here seen as a general fear of Islam throughout society emerge. And then, of course, it begins to solidify it with 9-11, uh, as, well, as, as pointed out earlier on. But also, certain other things begin to happen. In general, human societies contain all elements. They are, any society will have uh, people who are from the left, people who are the, from the right, people who are extremists of one kind, and people who are extremists of, 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 of another kind. Till about the turn of the century, moving into the 21st century, most extremist elements in Western societies but limited to their own little coteries. But what happens at the turn of the century is that modes of communication change. And suddenly we can communicate with people at a, at a very fast rate, very quickly, and very large numbers. The social media emerges. So those elements that they were in coteries suddenly now find a voice. So you see all those suppressed elements of the right in the West emerge to, in the foreground. So now, if you just step back and look at Europe, for example, you know, you can see that almost one third of France supports a fascist nationalist party, that a fascist party is almost in power in in Italy, uh, the fascist parties, extreme, extreme right parties are in power in uh, um, Hungary, Poland, uh, um, emergence of the right in, in Holland, 
in Spain, right? Um, and of course, the Trump phenomena in, 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 in America. These are all actually products of, of how social media has ena enabled some certain voices to come to the fore and be multiplied. And of course, extreme right fears everything that is not of its own. And therefore, the easiest tar targets are the foreigners and Muslims, so it has, they have perpetuated Islamophobia. So what we have now is, is a kind of discourse that was limited to structures of knowledge, to knowledge production, and to certain foreign policies and elites, now becomes a mass phenomena. So in a sense, what we have now is the industry that promotes Islamophobia. Islamophobia is not just a discourse, it's an industry, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a manufactured reality, it's something that is manufactured daily and distributed en masse. And that's something that has never happened in history. So Islamophobia, the contemporary Islamophobia, is a far bigger phenomena than anything that existed, for example, during the long periods of the Crusade Wars, pre Crusades. So we are facing a totally new phenomenon. So now I want to turn to the other, go back to my question that I raised earlier on Islam or phobia, who fears Islam? Of course, there are certain external forces that fear Islam. The fear of Islam for theological, intellectual, physical, and other reasons. But we fear Islam too. We also fear Islam. We fear Islam because we cannot come to terms with plurality. If I say to somebody, you are a Shia, and therefore you are not a Muslim, or your Islam does not confirm to my definition, and therefore you are not, in fact, you may even be a kafir. What am I doing? I'm engaging in Islamophobia. You are fearing the Islam of the other because you think Islam is something that only you can define, that only your sect or your mazhab or only your perception can define, right? There is more Islamophobia now <laughs> amongst the Muslims than has ever been in history. A bus full of innocent children going to school. Children are neither Shia or Sunni. They're just products of their parents, whatever their parents teach them. Is attacked by another group and all of them are slaughtered. Why? Because they were of a different sect. This is the deepest Islamophobia you can get. If you just look at the Muslim world as it is, we heard from the Qari, you, the Muslims are a, a brother. We, we are a brotherhood and a sisterhood. Brothers and sisters do not turn around and say, you are inferior to me because your aqidah is different from me. That's Islamophobia. If you do that, you are fearing the Islam of your own brother. This happens in many families. I know families where, where the parents reject the, the Islam of their children because the child has joined a Sufi, Sufi group. Right. Or the father is a Wahhabi, but the son is a bit more, or the daughter is a bit more liberal. And there is no tolerance. That's Islamophobia. If you are marching, 
if you are marching in the streets of Kuala Lumpur, in the streets of Kuala Lumpur, or just outside Kuala Lumpur, in the streets of Kuala Lumpur, waving, waving swords, right? Waving swords and other kind of prehistoric weapons. What are you saying? You're creating fear of Islam. That is Islamophobia. There's more Islamophobia among certain Islamic groups in Malaysia than there's Islamophobia amongst the races in England, where I come from. So we need to think of Islamophobia in a much broader sense. It's not something that is an external problem, but it's also, as was pointed out earlier, an internal problem. Okay, how do we deal with this in terms of the Padani discourse? Or, let me use the English term, script. Now, many of the elements of the script have very deep root in Islamic thought and Islamic concepts. You take the, the first word of script, sustainability. Now, we think that sustainability is something that the West has invented. Or now that we are forced to consider talk about sustainability because of climate change and all that. But sustainability has a deep history in, in Islamic thought, very deep in Islamic thought. I'll give you a little hadith. The Prophet observes somebody performing wudu, and he says to him, why so much waste of water? And the person who's performing wudu says, oh Prophet, but I am doing wudu. The Prophet says, you can waste water even in doing wudu. What could be more sustainable than that? See, the notion of sustainability is this. When we build cities, like Fez, Istanbul, the whole great cities, we always build them around the river, right? You look at Fez, it takes water from the river, supplies water to the city, and dumps it outside at the down so that there's no pollution. It has a wall not because it's for defense, but because of the notion of carrying capacity. The river can only look after so many people. So they built a ball so that the city does not grow beyond a certain limit, so that the whole environment does not become unsustainable. We built harams, and, and uh, the, uh, the haram zones, which were outside cities where you were not allowed to hunt, or, or kill uh, uh, wildlife because of the environmental consideration. That's the sustainability, right? We did not allow certain things to happen around wells, so the water in the wells is protected and it's not polluted or poisoned. That's sustainability. The notion of sustainability has a very long history. Similarly, if you look at other elements of script, care and compassion, that's what Islam is all about. You know, look at the Quran. You know, again and again, look after the orphans. Look after the orphans. Just count the verses where the, prophet, where the Quran tells, urges you to look after the orphans. That's care and compassion. Respect. Respect the other. If we have created you, you know, as nations and tribes, the verse tells you to respect the other. Respect the interpretation of the other. A Shia or a Wahhabi or somebody else is not a less, lesser Muslim than you because his interpretation is different. If you regard the Quran as eternal text, which we do as Muslims, then it will have numerous interpretations and will have in new different interpretations throughout history. That's the nature of an eternal text, otherwise it cannot be eternal. Therefore, we need to respect the interpretations of the other. We have to respect their views. We have to trust, build trust amongst each other, in a sense. So the script discourse actually offers a solution to Islamophobia, and it begins by looking at ourselves first. Let us understand 
what Islamophobia is all about. Who fears Islam? That's the fundamental question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Zia and Dr. Ahmad El Muhammadi for their insight and, of course, deliberately mention and explain more on the, the main topic. Of course, uh, while we have uh, listening to both speakers, I received many questions coming from the audience. Uh, of course, the way how we treat uh, the question coming up from the audience is basically to divide it into certain topic and dimension. Both speakers uh, did mention on Islamophobia as an industry. If you compare, I mean, just recently our Prime Minister just announced uh, distribution of Al-Quran specifically to Swedish, to, to Sweden. But of course, if you compare the industry and the amount given by any country, I mean, if you see Malaysia and just recently two years back, uh, 15 March being adopted by the United Nations as the day to combat Islamophobia. That one is sponsored by Pakistan and Turkey. But the way how uh, our foreign minister just now mentioning that we need to do something with regard to this issue. I mean, uh, while, of course, uh, see our brothers and sisters, I think we have our audience from different faith, different races, and we've seen as well our brother from coming all the way from Palestine, our, our brother from Uyghur coming all the way from Australia and Sweden. So basically, how you do address the minority issue, because somehow you did mention on the, the, the problem with regard to the Muslim minority in the majority Muslim country, but at the same time, how do you deal with those who now in minority Muslim country? So basically, maybe Brother Ahmad will address first. So basically, I mean, the, we, we have just now uh, the, the, the question coming from audience, for instance, uh, talking about Islamophobia among Muslim, how do basically uh, react strongly on Islamophobia in West while they turn a blind eye on Uyghur being a target of Islamophobia? And at the same time, uh, our brother also want to uh, see uh, how we can solve the issue pertaining to the Muslim uh, minority at the Muslim minority countries. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. I think uh, based on the, uh, what moderator has uh, said just now, the question asked about just now we are talking about dealing with the issue of Islamophobia um, as the majority group uh, and then their perception uh, by others. And the question is how we are dealing with the Muslim minority and the non-Muslim majority. Is that correct? Just like in the West. Number one, I would say uh, we acknowledge the, the problem of Islamophobia that exists in the Muslim uh, minority countries, for example, in New Europe, in the United States, uh, and other countries as well. Um, we, we have to understand, I think, first of all, uh, the local context where the problem is. Because the problem, for example, uh, in the United States and the problem in Europe, perhaps, even though the, it's similar in the form of Islamophobia, uh, xenophobia experiences, but the root cause is different. In Europe, perhaps, it's something to do with the emigrations of people from there uh, to European countries. And of course, when you talk about immigration, it's not the, something new. It's happened even before. But only recently, when the conflict is taking place in the Middle East, and more people are arrived in Europe, and this actually caused certain kind of perception and anxiety among the local people. It's happened because of the... Um, the Muslims as well, actually, we have, as I said, one of the problem, the way that we look at it is the individual problems. So what kind of attitude that these immigrants brings together with them whenever they are living in the country like that, in Europe, for example? 
I think there are certain things need to be done as well within the Muslim community um, who are living overseas. And one of the things perhaps we should educate them on the fake minority, fake akaliyat, for example, surviving or living in the Muslim minority country, which requires certain degree of mutual respectability, respecting the local cultures, respecting the local laws, for example, need to be informed to those immigrants. And uh, there are certain sensitivities uh, also need to be, uh, that we have to make them understand about certain sensitivities and certain things that they can and they cannot do whenever they are living in that kind of environment. Okay. Similarly, in the context where the, we have similar cases, for example, um, in the Muslim majority country, but we also have a minority group, for example, Shia, in the context of Malaysia, for example. Uh, how do we deal with this problem? Because, of course, there are some, some uh, voices who say that Islamophobia not only happened between two groups of community, between Muslim and non-Muslim, it is also has happened in intra-community, meaning that within the Muslim community themselves. How are we going to deal with this? Again, I think it's a similar principle. We need to understand the sensitivity of the, peop of the place of the people that you are living in. I mean, in the context of the Shia and Sunni in Malaysia, for example, the follower of Shia, the Shia community need to understand this is the Sunni state. Uh, just like we recognize Iran as the Shia state, uh, the Shia also need to recognize this is the Sunni state and we have to understand the sensitivity of each state. This is how we build trust, this is how we build respect. Similarly, if the Sunni living in Iran, they also need to respect the sensitivity of Shia people. So if we have Muslim here living in Europe or living in the United States, they, they, they need to understand this thing too. I think by, by having this kind of understanding that then we can actually lessen the problems of uh, uh, Islamophobia. But at the same time, we also need to acknowledge the existence of certain group which is extremist, which is not only, I mean, exists in the Muslim minority country, even the Muslim majority country, we have the problem of ISIS before. And we have the problem of radicalization, religious radicalization and political radicalization, we have it too. So we need to differentiate between the mainstream Muslims, majority Muslim who want to live in peace, and there are certain group of people of Muslim who has extremist ideology. We need to understand this, because once we start targeting the entire Muslim as enemies, then we are going to sideline we are going to, to create more problems than solution. Mass surveillance against mosques targeting Muslim, for example, has become institutionalized in the certain uh, in the certain countries in the West. So I think this is very dangerous move because uh, we do not differentiate between this is a group of Muslim who who can live in peace, who want to live in peace, and there are certain group of Muslim who have certain ideologies that is not only that exists in the Muslim minority country, but also in the Muslim majority countries. So that's my take, and thank you. Just, just to add, Prof, uh, from the non-Muslim angle, it seems like Muslim, when being a minority in a country, will always have conflict. Why is that so? Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Okay, as a first of all, uh, first of all, the question of um, uh, Muslim, minority Muslims living in, say, in Europe, in, in a majority non-Muslim country. Uh, there is a short-term solution and there is a long-term solution. The short-term solution is get involved in politics. Simple as that. Get involved in politics to see that the laws change. We in England, for example, uh, worked very, very hard to introduce uh, uh, Equality Act uh, 2010, and I was a commissioner for Equality and uh, uh, Human Rights and Equality Commission for six years working on this. Uh, and we introduced certain legislations which uh, banned religious hatred uh, and you know, denigration of the 
and, uh, of, of uh, certain communities and so on and so forth. So first, get involved politically, change the laws. Fight to change the laws, become, uh, uh, if possible, you know, become ministers <laughs> and lawmakers yourself. Yeah, that means get educated, get involved, don't isolate yourself, don't think you as Muslim must exist in a ghetto, culture, intellectual, or whatever. Get involved, get engaged, change society. One. There's a longer term solution, and that's we need to think about. And it's to do with the power of definitions. How do we define things? And what we need to do as enlightened Muslims is to change definitions. It is a epistemological question as well. Consider this. What, what do I mean by power of definitions? Consider this. A woman, let's say a white European woman, wearing a Louis Vuitton mask, uh, sorry, a scarf, is walking down the street, in the streets of Paris. People looking at her say, well, this is height of civilization, how chic, how fashionable. Now, take the same scarf, put it on a Muslim woman, not so white, maybe, slightly darker, walking in the streets of Paris, what do people think? Threat to civilization. Because that, that Louis Vuitton ma, uh, scarf now becomes a hijab. And by definition, it's a threat to... This is an epistemological question. You need to change the definition of what is freedom. What signifies freedom? You need to change the definition of what is human rights, what, what qualifies, who qualifies as human and who does not qualify as human. Because we are all human. Uh, you need to change the definition of who deserves respect and who doesn't respect, who doesn't deserve respect. We all deserve respect no matter who we are. These are epistemological questions. And of course, epistemological questions are also connected to power. This is the power of knowledge. We have to redefine certain aspects of knowledge because knowledge, as we see it today, is very much in the Western construction. These are Western epistemologies that come with certain definitions that are biased towards the West. And we have to redefine that. We have to rethink. And this is the, 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 the innovation component of script. We need to rethink and re-innovate what knowledge is all about, what, you know, what classifies as civilization, what classifies you know, as dignity. How do we define respect? Uh, and that's a very long-term question. So, get involved in politics, get involved in knowledge. Become highly cultured, sophisticated, and brilliant. That's your solution. Thank you, Prof. Another, perhaps, will be our last session before both panelists will conclude the discussion. Um, what role do Malaysian government play in promoting tolerance and respect among different communities? And perhaps, uh, from the Madinah constitution, which cater multi faith and multi race, uh, what the lesson can be implemented in terms of Malaysia as a cosmopolitan in nature, so that can be a model to other countries? Uh, yes, uh, I agree that uh, number one, Malaysia can play the role uh, in this uh, countering Islamophobia. Uh, that's number one. And I think that's a uh, the forum that we have today is actually a testimony to this kind of uh, commitment uh, to counter Islamophobia. And I think uh, it, can, we can, we, it can be done even more, uh, not just only organizing a conference and workshop like this. Uh, the second point I would like to mention is uh, Malaysia by nature and politically, if you look at from the political and social, uh, social perspective, is a multiracial society. And uh, we've been living in peace. I mean, we can choose the path of war, just like some countries. I mean, whenever they have a multi-ethnic group, we can choose to go to war or we can choose 
the way to peace. And I think because of the wisdom of the previous leaders, we choose the path of peace. And we try to build a kind of system that we can live together. I would say, of course, it is not a perfect system. It has some flaws, it's some sorts coming, definitely. But still, we can actually live together and we can build a country together. And I think many countries actually adopted similar kind of ways of making diversity as a source of strength rather than the source of conflict. Definitely, we can choose. We can choose diversity as a source of conflict, but we also can choose diversity and multi ethnic, religious, cultural diversity as a source of, of strength as well. And I think this is how we can leverage. One of the ways that we practice in Malaysia is through a dialogue and discussion rather than going to the police. And we do sometimes demonstrate, yes. But most of the time, whenever we have certain issues, it is done through discussion rather than and civil discourse. I think this kind of culture needs to be trickled down, trickled downward. Whenever we have certain issues, sometimes it is pressing issues. Of course, uh, for those countries who has, they say that we are going to use a legal approach to deal with this. We can actually. Let me tell you, we have a problem of radicalization in this country. Police arrested a lot of people from 2013 until 2020. More than 500 people were arrested for terrorism charges. That statistic shows our approach dealing with this, that is a legal approach, using laws to detain individuals, investigate the person, charge them in court. But do you think that's the only way to deal with it? No, we have to remember arrest people with certain ideology. You keep them in prison for quite some time, you're going to release them. Don't if you deal with the ideological aspect of them, then it's a threat to their society and it's going to spread their ideology as well. The problem is unsolved. We need just more than just having a legal approach. What I call this a judicial approach. We need wisdom to deal with this problem. So it is not just like uh, we solve this one problem and we create bigger problem or more problem. So certain needs to be done before we decide on certain policy. So these are the style of thinking and approach in Malaysia. I admit, however, there are certain weaknesses and shortcoming we have in our political system, regardless of laws and policies and so on and so forth, but at least Maintaining a certain degree of stability is very important. And I think if we talk about security and also the problem of this nature, such as Islamophobia, the intelligence and security component is very important. But we also need to include public engagement and long-term strategy, which include education, building trust, and so on and so forth. This is the wisdom that we can actually learn uh, from Malaysia, and I think that uh, uh, we can actually share uh, this experience with uh, other countries. I would like to mention one last point. <coughs> My work is actually dealing with counterterrorism. One of the things that we do is that we learn from the experience of other countries in Europe, earlier in Africa, in Middle East, and so on and so forth. We sit down in the room, we learn from the experience of others. Not to say the best practices, but I would say is the promising practices that we can do. We learn from each other. And I think the similar thing that we can do, whenever we have problem of this nature, regardless of Islamophobia or immigration policy, we can do similar kind of things. Exchanging experience of this nature and cross fertilization of ideas and promising practices that we have across the world is going to help countries to solve their problems. But if we just rely on one kind of approach, by using force, by using legal approach, detention, torture, and long sentences, this is not going to solve problem. In fact, generate bigger problem. Thank you. Hey, Professor Zia, how can we combat internal Islamophobia if everything is politicized? 
just to explain a little bit on the issue why we heard when politicians from Sweden, they are the one who burned the Quran and, and, and the country, the politician now becoming the main leader in the country. So basically how you solve the issue of holier than the Actually, the, to a large extent, what is happening in, in nowadays, especially West, is the product of what I call post-normal times. That things are moving very, very rapidly. Trends become very quickly. Um, the trend of, for example, burning the Quran was started almost in the West by a, a little-known priest who's called Terry. Terry Jones, he had a charity product, and essentially his congregation was only about 20, 30 people in the West. One day he said, I am going to burn the Quran. Quran. He just said, I am going to burn the Quran. He came out with a copy of the Quran, but he didn't burn it. He didn't burn it. And CNN got hold of that, and the channel Terry Jones is going to burn the Quran. He didn't burn the Quran. He just said, I'm going to burn the Quran. Right? All over the place. People in Pakistan heard here Terry Jones had said, I'm going to burn the Quran. He said, they heard. Terry Jones burned the Quran. So what did, what did the good people of Pakistan in the streets of Karachi and Lahore did? They went out and burned their buses, the very buses that will take them to, to work the following morning in protest. Right? They went and attacked some embassy, killed the, the guards who were their own people. Terry Jones did not burn the Quran. Hillary Clinton, who was then Secretary of State, rang him up and pleaded with him, and he said, yes. But after that, a number of the Qurans were burned. So it's not just that, that something is happening there, but that we are fueling what is happening there by reacting violently, not towards them, but towards ourselves. How ridiculous. This is what happened with the cartoon affair. The more fire you give to it, the more oxygen for publicity, the more, uh, you know, you know, it has, the more guys to defend their notion of oppression, the more they will be uh, So what we need to do is to calm down and step back and say, talk about it. Engagement. Now, you can see that once things become politicized, they're more difficult to handle. And we can't take politics out of every issue. But we do need to learn to approach these complex issues in a complex way, because many of these complex issues do not have a simple solution. We actually have to think more creatively about the issue and, and develop different solutions depending on the context. So this particular, in this particular case, uh, case that I have given you, when I was growing up, Sweden was said to be a model socialist society, tolerance, love, all this. Today, this is all bullshit. Sweden is not a tolerant society, it's a nasty piece of work, right? And this has all happened in 20 years. Now we have the person who is leading it. So in a sense, this is happening not just in Sweden, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a fascist government in power in Myanmar. Uh, there's a fascist government in power in Myanmar and look at what they have done to, to the Muslim people there. We must not forget what's happening in China with its Uyghur Muslims, where the entire culture and religion has been decimated. 
So it's not just this 3D problem. Uh, uh, what is happening in terms of, as I said, Islamophobia is not just a discourse anymore, it's an industry. Uh, industry everywhere. Okay? The legitimacy that, you, that the Muslims are one of the groups you can legitimately discriminate against, legitimately denigrate, legitimately, you know, uh, uh, it would uh, socially uh, exclude. And the industry, you, you, you need to have different approaches to this kind of sciences to try and to tackle this phenomenon. And I said there, there, there are long-term uh, solutions and there are short-term solutions. And we need to engage in both of these simultaneously. Thank you, Prof. And I would like also to thank to everyone for joining us in our discussion through the Q&A platform and those who also join us through our Facebook um, page. Uh, hope that our event today is useful. And the last, before we end our session, perhaps for about two minutes, a uh, concluding remark by our panelists. Start. Thank you. There are four points I would like to uh, share as a takeaway. Number one is uh, xenophobia is a, a, a global problem. It's a very serious problem. It's not a so today we are talking about Islamophobia, but I think it's bigger than this. It's bigger than just xenophobia. Actually, it's if you look at closely. It's not just the second one is the. Um, it's going to be uh, Islamophobia is going to create more conflict. I think we need to address this now because uh, we become more connected, and if we do not address this. Or try to use this to connect with each other. We will start to build more understanding, and then we are going to be more in conflict because there will be a more resentment and hostility to one another. So we need to kind of direct the, the, the attention, the energy to create more, to build more understanding, and uh, working together and cooperation. So that is the second point. Third point is the. Dealing with the Islamophobia and xenophobia, we need a judicious approach, not just legal approach. Maybe we can criminalize Islamophobia, but it's not going to solve the problem. We need to have a, a long-term strategy to deal with this issue. The last point is the today dealing with this kind of issue requires an individual responsibility, meaning that each one of us need to play our role uh, individually. Everybody must uh, play a role. The, uh, promoting the idea of uh, karamat al-insan and lita'arufi, that is a singular uh, idea. And then the seeing other people as different from each other, to benefit from one another, I think we are going to create more benefit than uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Large extent, uh, up to about 20, 30 years. This representation of the people of Islam, what is that? What limit is it in its purpose? In the Orientalism, for example, we can create uh, an academic exercise. Uh, even uh, the, uh, we saw their encounter uh, uh, when we were looking at them. That Islam is a society certain fiction writers. Uh, what has happened now in the last 20 is that the representation of Islam has spread and become part of popular culture. So it has become a mass problem. It's not just a problem in certain circles. It's not just a scholarly problem. Just not a, a problem uh, of um, people in the foreign office, you know, who want to denigrate certain people so they can, uh, uh, you know, justify their colonization or their, uh, their oppressive laws or, 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 or what have you. Now, an existential element of culture is there on your newspaper, on your 
share on your television, share on your social media, share on your advertisement, share on uh, print, right? Uh, and share on the street. Even what was regarded as regarded as high culture today was actually popular culture only hundred years ago. So the people who saw, for example, De Delacroix's famous painting of a, of a of a black you know circumcised man cutting the head head off of some white guy. But walking through the New York in its popular culture. Reported that people fainted when they saw that 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 picture, and and entire uh, segments of the city were had to calm down, right? The mass hysteria with that painting, right? Of a of a Arab, so-called Arab or Turk, performing an act of violence, right? So even even that aspect now has seeped into mass audience. It's become a different kind of problem, not the kind of problem that existed 10, 15, 20 years ago. Problem. And because it's become a different kind of problem, it requires a different kind of solution. One particular way to end this problem is to accept a copy of Bias in Popular Culture by my friend Nasrullah Sheikh, Dr. Nasrullah Sheikh. 13 years to write a very comprehensive account of how things have changed uh, and this essentially become a whole bias industry. It's not just Islamophobia anymore or even xenophobia or racism. It's just bias against everything that is the non-West. Universal bias, right? Uh, and I look forward to uh, the Prime Minister actually introducing the bill. Thank you. Please join me to give a round of applause to our both panel, Dr. Ahmad El Mohamadi and Professor Zia. Of course, we believe that by having this program, I mean, uh, for Minister for Affairs, Pachu, Prime Minister's Office, uh, together with Triple IT, of course, we believe that uh, this today forum event basically is all about uniting, not dividing. Uh, basically, we need to uh, demonstrate Nation Madani concept vision where the element of respect, trust, care and compassion, a son, must be instilled with all of us, especially Malaysian. With that, I would like to thank you, apologize for any shortcoming. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.